Patrick, how was the United Kingdom preparing for this great event? I think um, with great expectation. There were still people who believed it simply couldn't be done. People just couldn't believe we were really going to send men to the moon for the first time. And of course, there was always a feeling that something might go disastrously wrong. So there was an apprehension as well as excitement, I think. I'd like to bring an email in at this point, which sort of comes on off this point, from David Allen. He says, I find it so hard to believe that 30 years have slipped by, so many expectations for the future of man in space, and so few realised what happened. I mean, was it really enormously, it was all expectation, no idea that it would... I think it was. I mean, I think the people expect that by now we'd have lunar bases. And of course, you know, various things conspired to make sure that didn't happen. People forget, of course, that the unmanned program has gone on unabated. But certainly, it appeared the manned program has been held up, but um, I don't go back. But certainly there was a lot, of, a lot of hype then about that. You think we will go back? Sure we will. I would be very surprised if we didn't have a, a lunar base by 2010. But it does depend now so much, doesn't it, upon politics and finance. And if we want to do it, we can. Well, Wade, it would be hard to imagine any president now of any country standing up and saying, in six years, we will. True. Uh, they just don't have the power anymore. No, they do, don't. Do, do they, George? No, I don't think so. Uh, the same as in Russia. They uh, just dear Boris have... Yeltsin standing yeah. up and saying, I'm <laughs> going to have a man on Mars. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's impo absolutely impossible, yeah. yeah. And, of course, let's face it. I mean, at that stage, there was the impetus of the Cold War. I mean, the Russian America with the space race going on. I think, but for that, we wouldn't have got to the moon so early. Had to, had to have faced that. But effect. those scenes on the ground that we saw, I mean, it, it was a very divided America at the time. Well, 1968, the year before, was a terrible year in the U.S. You've, you're, as your footage shows, you know, there, was, there were riots in the streets, burning cities. There were two, at least two assassinations. There was a third attempt on Governor Wallace. There was the, the, the war in Vietnam. Time, I think this says it best. Time magazine has each year recognizes the person of the year or the man of the year. And that year they were planning not to have an individual, but to have as their man of the year, in quotes, dis Mr. Dissenter. Mm. Because it was a time of dissension. It was a time of malaise. And, all. and then a miraculous thing happened with Apollo 8. Apollo 8 with Frank Borman and Jim Lovell and, and uh, Bill Ander, uh, Anders circled the moon. And on Christmas Eve, gave greetings to the world and read passages from Genesis and sent back these remarkable pictures of the Earth. And Archie Ball McLeish said it was, we could see that gem in space blue against this black background of silence and there was such a uplift time magazine changed their the center mm. story and made Apollo 8 people's attitude changed in the United States and I think elsewhere and it led to Apollo 9 and Apollo 10 which were follow-on programs to to continue the development of technology and and the systems and the human systems and all which but led it, to Apollo 11. It's still 11. very hard to, to grapple with because in the main there was sort of long-haired, relatively um, sort of beaded and, as you say, pr protesting yeah, youths on the streets. And yet cut. here sitting on the moon were guys with a shorter haircut you could not get um, of very, very, well, of a military background. Um, they were in stark contrast. Yes. It was, uh, it was a demonstration, I think, to all sorts of populations and all sorts of generations at any place in the world that what you could do, what you could accomplish if you had the will and the dedication. I think, it, I think Apollo represents a strong will, to a commitment. And yet, what was to be realized beyond simply being able to say, we've done it? You said it was fantastic technological challenge, great feat. Um, lots of people thought it might not work, but what was there actually to be done? I mean, you knew a lot about the moon, you'd studied it all your life. Were there really things that we didn't know that we were going to learn from this? A great deal. Not only about the moon, also about our own Earth. I mean, don't forget the Earth-Moon system as one. In learning more about the moon, I'm learning more also about our own planet. And it had paved the way also. I remember, you know, a statement, I think, uh, made by an American scientist in the last century about this newfangled science of electricity. 
what's the good of it? And he said, Madam, what's the good of a newborn baby? <laughs> uh, we were going to the unknown. After all, man is a questing animal. Once we stop wanting to find out, we'll stagnate. I think the moon showed that. Also, it's perfectly true that um, just occasionally, the human race appears reunited. And it was so, I think, with Apollo 8, with Apollo 11, and of course later with Apollo 13. Hmm. Not so much since then, but I think that, that will come back. How, how did the broadcasters prepare for this moment? I mean, you, you were um, I was on the whole time, em yeah. thoroughly employed at this moment. We were indeed, because I remember it very well, because after all, I, I knew both Neil and Buzz. I was, I was a moon mapper, so I knew both Neil and Buzz. And indeed, you, you'd had input into, into well, the uh, mapping. In a very mild way, yes, I had, both of the two. And then again, down, I remember very well. I mean, the great weakness of Apollo was that there was no provision for rescue. And had they made a false landing, then of course they couldn't have got back. And therefore, I remember, when Neil's voice came through, the eagle has landed, I felt overwhelming relief. I remember that very well indeed. As a historian, do you, do you think there really was any point to the whole endeavor? I mean, leaving aside the space race, the, the ideological struggle, the actual point of going to the moon, did it have any historical sense to it? Patrick says we are a questing race of people. I mean, the, the, the human no, being... It, of course, it was always uh, the idea that uh, the man will reach the moon or other planet, always been a part of the intellectual uh, life and uh, Charles, um, everybody tried to, to imagine. Nobody could understand or imagine how much it will cost. So only when uh, the technology was started to develop and the uh, flight were under preparation, people or mm, government started to realize how much efforts, how much money uh, necessary to invest. But before this, uh, people didn't know about this and therefore the wish the desire, the intentions always did exist for this kind of travels. Speaking uh, of the uh, technology and the science, Patrick, how interested were the general public in that side of things? I think when Apollo 8 came along, the interest started to build up. It then fell away with 9 and 10, and then, in fact, with Apollo 11, there was a sudden surge of interest. And the people really were interested at that stage. And and they actually wanted to know the details of the science. They wanted to know the details, they did. They wanted to know just what was going on. Mm. And I say, there was still a sense, I think, of incredulity. Probably rather more so in Britain than the United States. And um, only when it actually happened, people realised the enormity of what had been done. And don't forget also, in those days, computers then were primitive, I'm bottom standards. <laughs> uh, presumably, I mean, actually in the Soviet Union, uh, very few people knew much about Apollo 11. Did they do, did, were you aware uh, you were a distant anyway, so, but I mean, were you aware that there was a moon probe going on and were you, were you hearing instantaneously, as we were, what was happening to no, it? No, no, not at all, yeah. Uh, the Soviet Union didn't try to publicize this American program, therefore uh, only very, very little uh, information was available about these flights and actually uh, there was no, um, uh, how to call, immediate uh, television coverage and so on. There was very, very short, for two minutes mm. uh, in, the, in the news. Uh, the, the I think it was the third did, did item so. after the celebration of the anniversary of the liberation of Poland, yeah. uh, followed by some particularly fine achievements in a tractor factory in the Urals, and then I think it ran somewhere there. Yes, <laughs> then that's a little. In China, for example, there was absolutely yeah. no information at all about the Apollo program or moon landing. Uh, they didn't it was China was the only country which didn't even report it in newspapers about this. Mm. Therefore, information about Soviet flights was very, very, uh, how to call, um, uh, publicized in, in, in great detail. But even uh, with Gagarin, with everybody else, we did find about when they already were circling. Mm. We didn't uh, watch the launch. Uh, therefore, if the flight be successful, then uh, the people be told about this, but not, not before. Therefore, every uh, Soviet, uh, how to call, flight was reported when it actually ha did happen. Mm. So therefore, yeah. the, the, all the accidents, all the problems which did exist were never reported. Mm -hmm. We only did find about this much, much, much later yeah. from archives, sometimes from memoirs. Of, of some people. Even Karolyov, whom uh, Leonov talked about, uh, general public didn't know his existence before he died. Incredible. Because uh, he uh, was one of the uh, great... He was the greatest person. Uh, yeah. The other great mm. uh, uh, man was Yangel, academician Yangel, who was actually like uh, um, uh, uh, Brown, 
in America was, uh, was German scientist. A again, the Russians uh, did find, or Soviet did find about him when he died. Mm. Uh, mm. Therefore, uh, the general public didn't know who invented, who designed, who made uh, what. They knew that there is general chief constructor, right. uh, but, uh, chief theoretician, but nothing else. But of course, Wade, you know, e even if you go to that spectacular and wonderful museum, the uh, Air and Space Museum on the Mall in Washington, you actually to see the uh, kind of Cold War fought out in the way the whole thing is set out. I mean, fundamentally, the references to the great, genuine achievements en route to getting to the moon that were made by the Soviet Union are only marked really en passant. Uh, the, the things that are celebrated are naturally enough, perhaps, uh, the American elements. Uh, and yet, as we've heard, Gagarin, uh, Lyonov's own first spacewalk, etc., were equally important uh, in the development of, of manned space. And recognized, too. Yeah. Yes, of course. Well, there was so much secrecy then, wasn't there? And I remember Von Braun himself telling me that what he wanted to do was to meet the Russian chief designer, Korolev, of course. Yes. And of course, those two never did meet. But they wanted to. It's incredible, isn't it, that you had these two towering yes. scientists, uh, Von Braun and uh, Korolev, yes. either side of the Iron Curtain, uh, battling away with absolutely yes. identical problems, and yet never and meeting. Met. It in Russia, it was military, entirely military. It was not civilian administration. It was Ministry of Defense and, and the Central Committee and so on. But it was entirely military program. But given that, it's really rather extraordinary that it was as successful as it was. I mean, you had, a, as, as, as uh, our, our friend General Lenov has, has said, there had to be a Central Committee meeting, a lot of people who knew nothing about space anyway, making decisions about it. You had a Politburo meeting then to rubber stamp that. The party had to meet at some point. Um, you know, it's amazing, really, isn't it, that, that anything ever got done? Because, I mean, NASA had a free hand. You've given all that money and off you went. Of course, all they made, they, were, they had a military start too. I mean, don't forget that um, Von Braun was actually building the rockets at Pinamunda. And rather frightening thought, we bombed Pinamunda, as you know, and I might have been on that raid. I wasn't, yeah. but I might have been. Can I just try and get another email in? Um, this one's from Paul Green. He says, hi, uh, he wants to know about uh, the whole panel, he says, where the significance in the event lies. So I suppose that's the question. Patrick, can you go first? I think that too, Ver. First of all, the fact that it could actually be done. It yeah. showed that man can cross space. And that was the start of everything. After all, had the Apollo program failed, then the whole process of space research would have been put back for a long, long time. And people also don't forget two things. First of all, the spin-off. I remember a little while ago, going to a hospital in Bristol, watching them there scan an unborn baby for defects, using equipment developed for use in space. And also, the cost. All right, the cost is high. By national standard, not very much. I think I'm right in saying that in 1969, the United States spent on space research exactly the same amount as it spent on military intelligence alone. And in the latest Mars probe cost, I think, one fortieth of a nuclear submarine. People forget that. That's amazing. That's amazing. The significance of it all? The significance now, we, we, we recognize that from this tremendous effort that came together to develop all the systems and prove out the technology has had, as Patrick has said, wonderful spin-off. Look what it's done to computers. 1969, the major computers mm -hmm. could fill a room. Yeah. But when the challenge was to develop a computer small enough to fit inside of a spacecraft, so it had to be small, it had to be light, it had to be reliable. Micro miniaturization is one of the great spin-offs, the mm. things that have come out from that. As Patrick said, as far as, as health, uh, the, the techniques that have been developed, the, mm. the expansion in navigation systems and in weather systems, a lot of it can be attributed to this effort that came. If, if there had not been this very concentrated effort, many of the things that we, we, uh, we now take for granted wouldn't be here or wouldn't have arrived in the fashion that Do you they, go they with did. all these benefits, or, or do you think it's a rather more questionable endeavor? No, in, in Soviet Union it was questionable, because there was no spin-offs. It was uh, a, a complete secrecy of everything, and the development was one-sided. The space research and nuclear research, mm. while in biology was still Lysenko pseudoscience, 
uh, charlatans in, in biology and genetics was forbidden. Computer science just started to develop. There was uh, very uh, little uh, computers, very few computers available for research. Therefore, uh, in Soviet Union, it was a, uh, mostly propaganda uh, value for the government, for Central Committee, for the uh, Communist Party to tell that this is a great achievement of, of our system. This was the, 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 the main uh, side in Soviet Union at the time. Patrick Apollo, bursting to get in. Apollo did draw all the various sciences together, and that happened whether the government liked it or mm. not. They couldn't stop it. All mm. that were combined, and as, they, as you say, in the Soviet Union, nothing got out. But the, the procedure was there, and they showed up afterwards. Mm. Very interesting. Well, we must leave it. another email that seems relevant at this time. It's from a guy called Steve, and he wants to know about Neil Armstrong. And he wants to know why does he not do many interviews these days? And, I mean, maybe, Patrick, maybe you know, did the moon landing affect him in some kind of way no, to make him Neil's more shy? No, Neil's a rather quiet, reserved kind of person. I mean, Neil and Buzz are so different. I mean, Neil is quiet and reserved. Buzz, in the best sense of the term, is a publicist. He, he, he enjoys it now. But Neil <laughs> was always selling he, did, he, did, he, did, <laughs> he did not enjoy it then, and, and th that was not the now. real one of the real problems. Yeah, but now. Yeah, and when we were, uh, when he flew a Gemini flight, we had a, uh, an inkling of what was going to happen with him. He had to get, it was the last Gemini flight, Gemini 12, he had to give a speech. He was outside the spacecraft on the, on the Agena rocket, and he gave a speech, and that was the highest heart rate we got in the entire mission. You beat the 180 when on the descent. When he gave the speech out there. <laughs> and we should, and we all, I, it went through my head then, you know, I know this guy has trouble. Well, he has real trouble with giving a speech. And when he got into this situation, after the, after the flight, he really had difficulty with it. And then he had, then that added, he began to think about all these things about, well, the world wasn't changing the way he thought it ought to change. And, but Patrick, but, you see, uh, look, we go back to the term lunatic. Um, people thought <laughs> the moon affected people psychologically. One point I would like to make here, though, it, you've got to remember the press. I mean, the press are, are on the track. Yeah. I well remember when Neil came over, not long afterwards, he began to do two interviews, with and Hill, one with, I think, one of the, the main programs, and one with me. And he did the first interview on live, and he was, oh, was it all worth it? Was it a way, you know, the usual kind of thing. Yeah. He then came in to me, we sat down, I, said, I remember him saying, thank goodness we can now talk some astronomy. Mm. <laughs> you remember the, the pressure on the track. But, I mean, the, the question that I was trying to ask was, does the moon in some way affect those who get close to it? I would have thought not. I mean, Chuck will know more about this than I do, but, um, and I know most of the lunar astronauts, and I say, I, I can't see it, but I say, I may be wrong there. Chuck? I, I don't think that there is a some particular psychological effect from the moon that changes someone other than it give, because of the fact that they the astronauts were on the moon you know that a lot of them changed their their lives after that about many of them felt that it, it was a religious experience and I don't think you could do that without having some feeling of a, of a religious experience and many of them changed their lives toward that now so you know We've talked about some of the, the sort of more downbeat, more depressing areas of life after space, but there were some quite uplifting times on the tour, surely, Wade Sinclair. I mean, you, you must have, you know, all the love from all these people, the hero worship. Well, I'll tell you, it was, it was, a, it was a marvelous experience in retrospect. It wasn't great fun along the way. Getting up at five every morning and going to motorcades and calling on heads of state and doing press conferences and doing four or five events a day, going to bed at midnight and getting up again, and with the astronauts kind of looking at you and saying, as Mike Collins would say, well, we're only supposed to have three events here. Uh, <laughs> uh, gee, uh, look, uh, one, two, let me see, can you now, count them off? Mike Collins actually brought you extra special publicity, didn't he, by needing to go to the toilet well, in Berlin. There, there's this, this, uh, this was when the, about halfway out, we had gotten to Bonn, Germany, and that evening, uh, Chancellor Kiesinger had a state dinner, and Mike Collins and Pat Collins spun off to go down to Genoa in Italy to celebrate and receive an award, but to celebrate uh, Columbus Day there. Uh, they flew back in on a small jet into Tempelhof in Berlin, and we came over from Bonn 
and landed at this airport. And there was a huge crowd. There was Mayor Schutz welcoming all of the astronauts and all in a huge crowd, as we did. Pat and Mike had gotten there, hadn't had any chance to deal with waste management. Deal with waste management, <laughs> but got in. First, had to, he had to make a talk. Each of the three astronauts. We got in the car in a Mercedes 600 with Mayor Schutz in the back with the three, and I was in my usual place in the front seat. And Mike, about we'd been to the wall, and we'd been to City Hall, and he finally said. I got to go. <laughs> and uh, he said, I can't wait. And I said, Mayor Schutz, we've got to stop. Colonel Collins has to have a pit stop. No, 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 no. No, we can't do that. Mayor, we have to do it. Finally, he says, oh, up ahead in the next block, there's, there's a factory. Uh, we can stop there. So we did, we did radio down the 10 or 12 cars in that and saying, we're going to make the stop. For gosh sakes, everybody stay put. And Mike is going to make a quick trip in the factory, which he did. And he came back, and the, car, the crowd let him through. And of course, they didn't recognize him <laughs> when he got back seven or eight. Minutes. He got in the car, and we went on. The next morning, the, the communist paper, which had not really covered much about this trip, did have a very laudable article that said, the, the, the American astronauts were so impressed with the workers of, of the, the oh, factory yeah. that they went in and had a visit. So. <laughs> <laughs> there, we've got to take a break. Uh, no. in, yes, we've got to.